efforts and achievements of the many generations before us. And if we allow private inheritance of private wealth, then we should allow for the social inheritance of social wealth. So in a sense, you can see that every individual, every commoner, should receive a sort of social dividend on the collective wealth, because you and I don't know whose ancestors contributed more or less to our collective wealth. Now, I've taken this theme further in my new book, Plunder of the Commons. But what I'm saying in that book is that the commons belong to us, and systematically they've been taken away from us, plundered, privatized, colonized, commodified, and we as commoners should be compensated for the loss while we strive to revive the commons. Now I'm an economic advisor for John McDonald, and I'm delighted to tell you that he is a passionate supporter of basic income, and he asked me to write this report, which we've just issued, in which we're saying that if Labour is elected, then there will be pilots around the country where we test out and see the effects of a basic income in different types of communities, testing the implementation challenges, what else is needed to make it, make it successful, and so on. And in the report, I address the reasoning why we must move in this direction. But the second ethical reason is that a basic income would enhance freedom. It would enhance freedom, the, the right to accept this freedom, the freedom to say no to an exploitative employer, landlord, or a relation. But it also would support liberal freedom, the moral freedom. You can only be moral if you have basic security where you can make decisions yourself. You can't be moral if Ian Duncan Smith tells you you've got to do X, otherwise you get your benefit. You can't be moral in those circumstances. And the third freedom that the basic income would enhance, it would enhance the freedom from the power of unaccountable authorities. It would give you the capacity to face each other as equals. In no respect with a basic income of the level that we could imagine coming in tomorrow would give us all of that freedom, but it would move in the direction. And that's what we must do as radical, transformative, political animals. And the third reason is that it would give people, even if the amount was very modest, it would give people basic security. Security is a public good, and it's a superior public good in the sense that if we all have security, it enhances the security of all of us. That is unlike a private commodity. Now what I've done in this report and in the book is take the beverage idea of slaying five gallons. Those of you who read the beverage report of 1942, say, he said, we have to slay five giants. But I'm saying now, today, we have to slay, as progressives, eight modern giants. I don't have time to go through those eight giants there in the books and in this report, but I'm just going to read them out, just say them out, and then we can come back to them. The eight giants that we face as progressives, that a basic income will help weaken each of these giants. The first giant is inequality. And fundamentally, our income distribution system has broken down irretrievably. We will not overcome rentier capitalism unless we have a different form of income distribution. <laughs> and in a sense, a basic income will capture some of the rent, rental income that's going to the plutocracy and the elite for us parents. There's more of the arguments on that. The second one is insecurity. We have a society in which millions of people are suffering from chronic insecurity. And we don't have a strategy 
to give people security, basic security. And the basic income would move in that direction. The third is debt. Private debt. It's a pandemic. And basic security with a basic income, even if it's a modest amount, as we found in India and Africa and Canada and Finland, even if it's a basic amount, helps people get a little control over their debt. The fourth is stress. One of the wonderful findings of all the pilots on basic income is it reduces stress. It makes people less stressed because they feel they've got at least the assurance of the basics. The fifth is precarity. I've written books on the precariat, and I'm Ed Miliband has told me recently he wished when he was leader he, he championed the precariat. But the precariat of people who are supplicants. They don't have rights. They're losing rights in, in so many respects. And basic income is a form of economic right. It's moving in that direction. The sixth are those robots, that giant of robots making us redundant. I don't believe it will make us redundant, but it's increasing inequalities and the insecurities of more and more people. But it's the seventh giant that will tip the balance, I believe, towards more people wanting a basic income. That seventh giant is extinction. We need carbon taxes. We need taxes, eco taxes. We need moving strongly in that direction. But as Macron has found out, if you do that, you increase inequality, insecurity, blah, blah, blah. It only makes sense if with the revenue raised in that direction, you recycle it as a form of basic income. That's a long argument, but I can develop it. And the eighth giant, which I have to stop at, is neo-fascist populism. If we have a society of chronic inequality, chronic insecurity, and the rest, more and more people are going to be voting for the Trumps, the Johnsons, the Brexits, and the various other extremists on the right. A basic income will at least help our sense of social solidarity and return us to sanity by having it as a program agenda. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you guys, and um, all of that plus. <laughs> um, I, one thing that you, that, that you left out of your definition was that basic income would be paid to each individual, um, which will make a big break with our current, uh, our current welfare system. Um, as you heard, I am a, a welfare, or I have been a welfare rights advisor, and I also lived on the dole for many years, raising my son, uh, partly out of choice, uh, in the sense that I couldn't really I, I wanted to look after him, and uh, but also because there were, you know, there was always kind of caught in this thing between, you know, I, I couldn't get a job without having childcare in place, so I couldn't get childcare without having a job. I couldn't get subsidized childcare without even having a job in place. Um, what I'd really like to see, and what I think basic income would really do to promote, is um, is is really kind of reimagining the economy as one of care rather than just a proxy profit-generating machine or a, a kind of growth, a growth engine. Um, you know, as I'm sure everybody's aware, we're in a kind of huge emergency right now, both in terms of ecology and also the um, social emergency that's happening between us. Um, the current trends, you know, currently, you know, when, currently people are actually killing themselves because, you know, when they lose their, their money. You know, whether that's uh, informal support allowance or universal credit or having to go through, you know, whatever welfare groups there are. And a lot of people that we've seen in our, in our advice service, um, they get into massive amounts of debt before they start to claim. They come to us like at the very last thing, you know, that's like the last thing before they actually get checked out of their house. Um, and just to remind people as well uh, that the, the kind of unpaid element of the economy is, is now estimated by the ONS to be over one trillion pounds 
And that's not just care after each other, it's also the time people were spending to get to work and various other things. Um, and that really, that work has really followed mainly on women, especially with the cuts, that, that we're kind of seeing that we have to work a lot harder for our families, uh, for our friends, for our communities, just to make sure that, that things actually carry on. Um, the other thing that we've seen with the cuts is, is that domestic violence and murder has gone up quite a lot. And again, that, that impacts mainly on women. Um, it's one reason why I'm very, very passionate about this income being paid to the individual and not the household, because I think we, we all individually need money of our own, but also households are changing so rapidly that, you know, having to kind of report back about changing circumstances and stuff is going to be an onerous thing. Um, yeah, so I would just say this very shortly that, that basic income I think is needed yesterday to address all of these problems um, and it should definitely be on top of any disability or housing, extra housing that people should have. And that's all I've got to say right now. So, I suppose I would say the main difference between what I've heard so far and myself, and by the way, I'm pretty great, 95% of my political analysis and what we need to do next, is that I don't look at the policy solutions we now need to adopt from an ethical standpoint. I look at them from a, an empirical standpoint. So, let's look at the crisis which is going to define the 21st century rising inequality, climate change, demographic aging automation and underemployment. My view is that in order to address these as rapidly as is necessary, because it's going to be rapidly necessary in terms of climate change, 2030 is it's a brilliant motion to pass and we should be very proud that it's happened. Uh, is it too late for two degrees? Possibly. Uh, but we can still develop three or four degrees warming. But to do that, we need to understand the socialist policies we need to run through universal basic services and universal basic services. So if you want to nationalise the big six, if you want to rapidly decarbonise distribution transportation systems in five, ten years, if you want to create um, public infrastructures of communal luxury, fantastic free electric buses for everyone, everywhere in Britain, you're going to have to adopt that perspective of EDS. And so I am very inclined to agree with the, the ethical and philosophical argument, we'll talk about that in a second, and I do agree with what Guy said about unfreedom, and we need to understand that the, the liberal project of freedom within capitalist economies remains an unfinished one. Uh, I think that given the broader context of the crisis, which by the way I think are existential challenges for market capitalists, you know, it's very difficult to see how you get new spheres of growth that seems to me impossible to have elevated standards of living with that long crisis we've seen since 2008, with climate change, with demographic aging, with automation and unemployment. And I'll talk just about demographic aging, for instance. You know, the, the average person um, who was born in 1900 would have a life expectancy of between 35 and 45 globally. Well, today, life expectancy in India is 72. Right? And while austerity has meant, um, actually for the first time in the century, life expectancy is falling in wealthier countries, we will see a growing cluster of what's called the oldest old in pretty much every country. Now, what does that mean? It means you have about 25% of the population having incredibly expensive healthcare needs. Dementia, recovery from cancer, recovery from stroke, very, very labour intensive. And historically, conversations around care, social reproduction. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, the, this demographic ageing, uh, blame the old. I'm not blaming the old. Everybody has a stroke. No, let me finish my point. Now. Yeah. The, 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 death, rate, the death rate of older people has massively increased. This idea that we're aging well, we and are. saying that we have. Can I finish, can I finish my point, please? You, you will not want to question. These people have come here to adhere to some process. But the thing is, 
You haven't even. You, I agree with you. Let me. Thank you, Carl. This is rude to the rest of these people. It's, it's not. It is. It's not. It's not. If you want to have one more conversation, you feel free to. You always feel. Next question. Go ahead. Give me that. Give me I'm more than welcome to answer any questions, but let's just adhere to the process because then because everybody can have their thoughts heard. So, um, no, no, no. You think you're right and you're angry and passionate about that. That's very welcome, but let's do it in a deliberative type of way. So, uh, my view is, based upon the empirical data, that we will have a rising number of older cells, as we've seen over the course of the last 35, 40 years. Now, according to Standard and Poor Credit Rating data, in 2016, they published a report which said that 25% of all the countries on Earth will be unable to finance social care for their populations given current trends. This is why the Tories want to increase the public pension age to 70. That is, not, that is why we saw the dementia tax in the 2017 general election. It wasn't just the political mismanagement, of course it was partly that, but we also need to have a profound shift in terms of resource allocation to care for people suffering from these conditions. The number one cause of death in this country today was it? Dementia. That's very new. And by the way, I don't mean to free to Google. And as anybody who is a relative or a friend who suffered from these kinds of conditions, the resources to, uh, to create um, care for them is incredibly expensive. Now, the response should be, well, in the US, they have a private healthcare system that costs 16% of GDP. We have a universal healthcare system that costs 8% of GDP. The point is not that we can't afford to pay for these people through a system akin to the NHS, is we can't afford not to. Right? So you need universally funded um, uh, care for young and older alike. Now, what does that mean? It means you have universal child care, I would say, from one. I would say it means you have a national care service for the disabled and the elderly. Pardon? Yeah, uh, so my point would be, with universal basic services, with regards to and systemic aging, this is a much better way to manage um, aging than UDI. People say, well, women do all the caring, so we should give them the UDI. Stop that. Why should be women doing all the caring? Let's have a socialised, collectively funded care service where people are remunerated properly to do this stuff, and they are professionally capable of doing this stuff. It seems very strange to me that we say, let's take a class from a very amateurish way of administering care. So, that's the first. Um, in, in regards to talking about liberty and, and, and freedom and unfreedom, we agree on this. And I actually think, and Yannis Marapaka said this last night, socialism isn't necessarily a project of equality, which it is, but it's also a project of liberty. Now, people say, how do you try and persuade liberals? I often say, if you're a real liberal, you should be a socialist. What does that mean? It means that the liberal idea of happiness uh, is contingent upon the individual being uniquely capable of deciding how they want to live their life. I agree with that. But the point is you can't have liberal ends with liberal means. Because you can't do that self authorship without access to resources like healthcare, housing, education, transportation, which is where UBS comes in. And so again, if we're talking even at ethical philosophical level about ending unfreedom, I think UBS is a far more powerful way of engaging with that problem than universal. Uh, and I guess I'll, I'll finish with this. Um, where we do agree, and I think we probably all have to have a UBI at some point, is in relation to technological change, the breakdown of the price mechanism, or automation, general artificial intelligence, or due to labour markets. Which is why the labour government immediately should absolutely invest in pilots, uh, and we should absolutely look at ways of decoupling access to certain goods and services from the wage range. Right? And by the way, UBI in abstract is a very radical proposal. You know, the idea that you disentangle the wage relation or wages if they can buy things from work. It's a very powerful thing. Uh, and it makes perfect sense in that context of technological change. But because of the things I've talked about, these crises set to determine the 21st century, I think as socialists, we need to understand that the UBI is a little bit further down the road and that the concrete policies which allow us to kind of break with neoliberalism but also move to something better will be more or less contingent on universal basic services.
very sort of campaigns as well. Now, we've heard all the academic arguments about why we should have either basic services or basic income. I'm against it, primarily. I'm not totally 100% against it, but I, I'm more against than pro. Is because it addresses the distribution, but it doesn't address production. And there's no guarantees, as a disabled person myself, from being on the, 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 the far end of ideas and stick. Um, it doesn't guarantee any sickness or disability leave. We all know that if you go to work and you have too much time off work, you're going to be getting your feet fortified pretty sharpish. And the, the reasonable adjustments for disabled people frankly suck because they are so minuscule you could blink and you would miss them. There are a few very good employers who will go the extra mile, but they are few and far between. Guy mentioned that he was obviously um, the extra cost that disabled people um, incur, whether it's buying in services to get the garden done, to clean the windows, to help somebody clean the house. That's without the care that Aaron's just brought up. We have a, a good social care system and it has been subsequently destroyed from within. We had the ILF and that was removed and that enabled disabled people to live and be part of their communities. And I'll be honest, it makes me quite cross um, when we don't talk about a system and it's everybody's nightmare, whether you're on the right or whether you're on the left of the argument, we don't talk about raising tax. That horrible, dirty word called tax. Because if we actually paid a little bit more tax, we would be able to afford our NHS. We would be able to look after our elderly and disabled people and our children. We would be able to do all these things just by raising it. And I'm not talking a massive raise, we're talking, you know, a small, minuscule raise. Having read, um, I mean, I've read Guy's recent report, and um, I've also read Mr. Andrew Lansley's report, where he talks about putting a minimum, minimum income flooring into a system which would basically be a UBI, which is a bolt-on to existing benefits. Now, I've looked at the ME report and the Roundtree report, and I would argue, let's stop using the word basic. Let's call it adequate, because our rising costs in society, whether it's your gas and your electric, whether it's various food prices, whether it's the cost of clothes, whether it's more insidious taxes like VAT, which have been creeping up. We need to cover those. There is nothing wrong with somebody who wants to be part of the system and wants to be part of society. We are continually locked out. We have got no access to buildings. Transport, public transport is an absolute disgrace for disabled people. I have travelled on public transport here today with, and without assistance from, thank God, from the, the British Rail. I would not have been able to negotiate that transport system. And thankfully they will be around in a wheelchair so it saved my legs quite considerably. But there is no way, to my mind, of developing a UBI model which will work in every context of capitalism. 
because it constantly changes and adapts. And the biggest problem we've got, we need to switch from CPI back to RPI, which this government changed in 2011, because that increased benefits, we need to remove the benefits freeze, which has disabled people have suffered for the last God knows how many years, it must be close on five now. We need to look at the level in which these incomes are granted to the individual. There is also a lot of debt accumulated because of universal credit. We've all seen the shop horror airplanes. I've personally lost friends, close friends, due to this welfare reform. And I can't say I'm happy. But the one thing we can't take off the table is we can't guarantee that we don't have a banana government. We could get Corbyn in and five, six years down the line, we'll get another Tory government or another government and they will switch it back and they will cut harder. Because every time DPAC and others campaigners on the grassroots have fought back, they have come back at us and cut it more and more and more. And that's all I've got to say on it really, but like, I would err on the side of caution. Don't throw it out in the bath water, but be very careful of what you wish for, because it depends on who's holding the keys. Thank you.
And you don't get empowered by having a basic bus, or a basic food bank, or what other basic service. They're good, maybe, they're needed. But you need to have freedom, and freedom only comes when you've got enough money in your pocket to be able to make decisions. And on the last point I will make, relative to something that Gail said, she mentioned something about not helping production. But if she looks at our books on the, the actual experiments we've done, in every single case, it's led to an increase in production. And in particular, the production by people with disabilities. It's one of the wonderful phenomena that it actually enables people to take risks to actually overcome certain barriers themselves and develop their lives. And I'd like to, to continue that debate because I don't think we've got fundamental animosity between us. It's a matter of moving both sets of things forward from this dystopia that the Tories have given us. Thank you very much. You can eat healthily. You're less of a problem for the NHS as well, long term, because you will be eating healthily, you will be able to feel well in yourself, because obviously, if you're eating, and God, don't think I'm slagging off food banks because I'm not, but long term use of a food bank is not healthy. And we are having families who are in long-term use, and their children. Those children will grow up to be adults who have severe needs, and that is because of food poverty. And we've got massive, massive inequalities on that score. But when we're talking, when we're talking about the, the, the basic services, it should be a right, a human right, to have a roof, to have food, to have subsistence. If you can't work, if you can work, you should get off your backside and do it. Shouldn't be claiming, I don't want to pay any more tax because it benefits us all. Because if we've got a healthy society and we're putting money back into the economy because we're more proactive, we're more productive, in going out and seeking, like I was saying there, in overcoming some of the barriers for those who can, that then creates jobs and puts more money into the economy as well. And those, those are the things, and I will read the, the, the thing that you mentioned, Guy, but I, I mean, I have been sort of spending the last two weeks now, and I'm, I'm thinking I'm UBI out a little bit. But I, you know, the basic services, but the basic income, it needs to be adequate. It's no good having something basic if it's not meeting your needs. And that's what we don't get. A lot of the time, it's not meeting our needs. And it is, at the moment, since 2010, the median income is about 30% now, compared to what it was. And that is because of the continuous cuts over the last decade. So when we're talking about these things, we've got to live in the real world. I live in the real world. I've been on the wrong end of that stick. I have had to use food banks. Yes, I've got debt. And the reason I've got those is because I can't participate as well as I would like in society because of the barriers that are put there by the people in power. And that's what I want everybody to think about when we're starting talking about moving this debate forward because that's really important. It's no good having somebody who comes in for a 10 minute care visit. I've been on that receiving end when I had my hysterectomy. I was incapable of doing anything. I even go to the loo on my own. Yet I was expected to have a 15 minute visit twice a day. God help me, what happened the rest of the time? 
and these are the fundamental things and with people with dementia and other age illnesses but as we're living longer we're all going to get ill I mean I'm sorry but the body parts are only need to go so far it's a bit like the car yeah you can put oil and water in it you can put fuel in it you can keep running it but sooner or later the bloody wheels are going to drop off so let's get real let's get really real and think about how you would manage if you had no family if you had needs and services that you wanted and you couldn't get them because of the barriers that are put in the place by those in power. Thank you. Oh yes, I think it's important to highlight that what is income? Income is a means of accessing goods and services that you either need or that you want. Uh, and if you're a Marxist, what's the role of money? Uh, money serves as a means of exchange for purchases, or it acts as a store of value for future means of exchange. Uh, and so there's not necessarily, so I think there's an ideological claim that necessarily you should be accessing the goods and services you need through money points. Maybe you can just access those basic human rights through universal basic services. However, here's some space for free. I do think that this isn't a universal basic human. I do think there are clear arguments for a UPI based on the studies we've seen in the curriculum evidence. Will it be in our evidence? Universal basic income absolutely works given autonomy to act. The Global South, the poor is poor. Universal basic income seems to be a very, very intervention in terms of uh, eradicating uh, income deprivation. Um, there's one more. So I'm not, not going to disregard it and say it's silly. For homeless people, there was another study actually more recent about how effective this can be. Some people are really down on that. I absolutely agree with the idea of just making a really decisive intervention and giving them uh, the ability to access goods and services with some cash. I absolutely agree with that. But in terms of how we need to think about uh, our disposition to goods and services and how they're allocated in society more generally, I think UBS is a, a bit more powerful way of doing it. Now, where we probably disagree, with Guy and I, is that I think, because I'm a communist, we see what I'm a communist. And I believe that just feudalism is a contingent social system in the beginning, middle, and end. So is capitalism. And I think something replaces capitalism as well. Uh, and the intervening period is socialism, where you change the relationship of workers to working people. You have to work with working people in 99% to the means of production. But that's merely an intermediary stage. So what's communism? Communism is where you replace private ownership with ability to access things. Now, I'm afraid, flippantly talked about infinity calls for everyone. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you think about sort of capitalism mode production, it means literally everybody owns an infinity pool. That's ridiculous. What it means a communist is everybody has the ability to access a beautiful infinity pool. And some people say, that's absurd. But again, I think the claim that that's absurd is an ideological one. In the 1930s, well, look, we've got beautiful lighthouses across the country, it's one very near in Salt Lake. So you're telling me that that was plausible 80, 90 years ago, but we've got to do it now. 1952, the Golden Lane Estate. Near the Balkan, council housing, had a swimming pool, tennis courts, nursery. This is for working class Londoners. The idea that we can't do all these things to people very easily, actually, without major changes, is not true. And by the way, Golden Lane State today, guess how much you rent a room for? £950 a month for a room. This was for communal luxury for ordinary people 70 years ago. So we probably disagree about that rights of access and, uh, and, and how we administer it. And something caught my mind when you said we really want universal basic buses. Yes, you know, when I'm waiting for a bus, I don't go, well, this is what, I don't quite understand about market competition sometimes. Can you imagine if you're waiting for us, oh, the bus is coming to go to where I want to go, but I'm going to wait for this different brand because the rating is 0.5 best. That driver is much friendlier, and, you know, it's going to, it's going to, the, the, the consumer experience is going to be a little bit better. No, you literally get on the first bus to go where you want to go. I, I don't think it's that complicated. And I'm not saying all of the economy, all of society should be run like that. But I think the things that we probably agree on as necessary to live a dignified, meaningful life, I think, should be run like that. And I'll, I'll, I'll finish with it. Sorry, I'm really angry. Um, there's a great book called The People's Public Warmer. And it talks about, and it goes back to this point about accessing goods and services through paying for food pricing. 
And one of the arguments of 20th century socialism was something called the socialist calculation debate. Let me get the pointy head out. Now, what is that? It's historically been a very good critique by neoliberals of socialism. And they say, look, all the central planning you want to do is never going to be as efficient and effective in terms of resource allocation as market um, prices. And what we're increasingly seeing with big data, machine learning, and algorithmic intelligence is that that's not necessarily true. Actually, it may be entirely plausible to allocate resources in a very centralized, in command and control way when you have access to that amount of information and actually undermines the argument around the socialist calculation debate. If that was true in the 20th century, it's what Milton Friedman or Hayek argued, it probably isn't in the 21st. So I will very much defend. The importance of the state in providing goods and services to all of us, independent of any ability to pay. Uh, I want to kind of pause the, uh, the conversation about all those services. I feel like that's part of the conversation that we will be and they might not know my sound. I want to bring Bob in here and talk about. Um, Commodification of care. 
all right, has just gone absolutely insane. You know, there has been, yes, there's been this kind of move over towards, um, you know, we're going to pay for care, and what's that, what, what's that meant? Okay, that's meant this horrendous kind of globalization of, of women wandering around, the world, you know, basically coming up to the global north to look after the kids and the elders and the sick of, of white people, right? And that's got to change. I'm really happy that this become is an international movement because I think, you know, hopefully we'll get some kind of global history from eventually. Um, but the money really is key because the money actually just gives you choice. And I think the choice is important. It's not that we want, you know, different kinds of buses, all right, coming down the line. We just want the bus to get there, obviously, all right? But it's, it's, it's actually empowering people to make choices for themselves in a way that services don't, not necessarily. Of course, it depends on how they're structured, and UBS, the ideas around UBS have a whole set of other ideas around how that could happen, um, not very fleshed out ones, but I think that the whole services thing is also, it's really not trusting people to be able to, you know, work out for themselves what they want, and work out, you know, ways to work together. And, you know, in a, in a kind of system at the moment where we're constantly kind of competing with each other for money, um, I think they say kind of undercuts that in a very significant way. The other thing that concerns me, and I think Joy and Robert touched on it, is the rest of all of in universal credit, you've got that horrible white clause, which, frankly, I mean, anybody who, who actually thought that up, it's absolutely disgusting, yeah. beyond belief. And then you've got people on universal credit who are in a domestic violence relationship, and while the alternative payment arrangement addresses partly some of that, but there's nothing stopping the abusive partner, frog marching their partner under the threat of violence down to the cash point to withdraw their half as well. And that is something that really concerns me, particularly for women, because we tend to be, it's not exclusively women, but 90% 90, 90 I would say is women who are subjected to domestic violence and rape and various other things. To have to go through the absolute inhumanity of having to regurgitate to justify the rape clause or to justify to a person, maybe a job centre advisor or somebody like that, that your partner has taken your share of the alternative payment. This is something that people are not thinking through. Because if 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 there is no mechanism without removing the abusive partner to stop women being subject, subjugated in this manner and having their money removed from them. And that impacts on the kids. So, uh, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, that's a yeah. Just to say, I mean, one thing that really did um, help women deal with this was child benefit. And it's, I mean, I think it's quite interesting, you know, this kind of discussion of services versus income. I mean, this all happened uh, in Eleanor Rathbone's day back in the 30s, <laughs> when she was arguing for family allowances. And all the same things came up about why money was not really quite good enough and everything. But she really insisted that, you know, that what family allowances, which became child benefit, that women really do need that money, all right? And, um, you know, and that's really, I think, the, the key thing that this can come to the individual, and, you know, that it's really going to, you know, going to help that. But it's one other point I have which I've lost. <laughs> Thank you. 
which we would expect to see should, for example, drug dealing rise further. Let me let me break the uh, answer your question but pause but respond to the point made earlier about uh, being a communist. I, I believe passionately that we should have a strategy for demodifying people. Okay? That means that we're not subject to market forces. We've got independent capacity to resist market, market pressures on us. And the danger of these ideas of services is basically it's the state, and that's really been a communist tendency over the last 100 plus years. The state says to you, I know what you need, and I'm going to provide. The basic income advocate says, I don't know what you need, but I do believe that you should have the means to acquire it. There's a different mentality coming into the, 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 the debate. Now, I want to come to Gail's point because I think we're all united here in saying that universal credit should be scrapped ASAP tomorrow morning. It's an evil system.